My diagnosis is depression with psychosis. That means I have delusional thoughts sometimes and hear voices in my head. And that sort of meant that I've not lived in the world. I was frightened of people and their reactions to me and I was very much at home in my own room, in my own space, in my own mind. And that's, that's really debilitating. Mm. It means that the, the, a lot of the time I'm, I'm quite paranoid of um, things that may or may not be going on in the community. It's very distracting. It's very distracting. I'm getting it now. The voices are telling me things that, that may or may not be happening about, you know, this interview, and it's not very helpful, not very pleasant stuff triggers into sort of the paranoia and, and what have you. Do you want to have a break and put things might have a smoke here. Yeah. Sometimes you can't separate reality from the delusion, and that's when it is at its peak. For example, with the um, camera crew was, was thinking that the, getting footage on me for some purpose to use against me. Um, and the questions are going around in my head and voices are saying they're trying to hurt you and trying to confuse you. The voices, I think, see themselves as being protectors of me, but actually they stop me from doing things. This exhibition is a sort of a culmination of the last five or six years of my work. It's a bit of a retrospective. It really follows the journey that I've taken emotionally, mentally, intellectually as an artist and as a human being. I guess you could split the works in, in two. There's a lot of emotion in the earlier works, a lot of anger and a lot of um, emotional turmoil. The works I've done more recently are more contemplative aimed at thought-provoking rather than yelling at people. I've got works in here that actually yell at you. Yeah, this is a painting that was done in 2010. It's done with house paint and um, as, a, as a base and then spray paint as the, for the dialogue. Um, it came to me when I saw something on the news about people, Greenpeace people, throwing themselves at Japanese whaling ships and risking life and limb, and I thought, why doesn't anybody risk life and limb for me. I started painting while I was in the Auckland Mental Health Unit as a way of trying to get myself out of my head. I found it helped to try and mitigate against the depression I was in, the voices that I was hearing. All around me were black dogs. On the, sitting on the bed, sitting on the floor, lying on the cupboard, and the dogs were talking to me, so it was an audio-visual hallucination, and that was even more frightening. And I was tired and hungry and emotionally fraught and going through this depression and this psychosis, and I didn't know what was happening. So I painted that. I had to get that out of me. 
once I got out of hospital, it's like being plonked back in the ocean or being thrown off a ship. You know, when, when you're in hospital, everything's done for you, your food, your meds and all of that. But once you get out of there, you're left to your own devices again. And so I came to, to Toyora and my art came along. It's probably the most effective therapeutic tool I have in my arsenal now. Born in 75, I was taken off my birth parents and made a ward of the state. Was fostered until I was eight and then adopted into an English family who'd immigrated from the UK. My birth parents were both drug addicts and they'd both spent times in and out of jail. So they probably couldn't look after me as well as they, they should have. I was seven when I first heard voices. And again, when I was about 11 after an abuse, situation of abuse. And that holds really bad memories for me and gives me nightmares and often I relive it as part of the PTSD. Today I'm getting my injection, after that I have my psychology appointment, then after that I start my new job. Come on in James, how'd you get here today? Uh, I've got a lift. Most people just get up, have breakfast, have a shower and then go to work and I've got to do all this other stuff to start me off on the day. The injection is um, of a lanzapine that'll be, well, that helps reduce the level and intensity of the voices I hear. Well, lanzapine is an antipsychotic um, intramuscular um, form of the oral drug, a lanzapine, and it's, um, it is primarily for um, uh, thought stabilisation, if you like, for it's an antipsychotic. Without it, as James states, the voices can overwhelm him, so can paranoia. So those two things together can actually lead James to become quite psychotic um, or very disturbed and he then stops sleeping. Um, and then with lack of sleep and overwhelming thought processes, it's not very long before someone actually starts uh, collapsing. All right, James, it's time for the actual injection. Really, the, the kudos goes to James on the fact that he's opting to take this injection. A lot of clients would never, ever opt to have an injection. Most people want off it. It's cleared away some space in my head to, to focus on other things, more positive things. It means I can look to start the day and, and go forward, yeah. Awesome, and what is today bringing for you? Well, I start my new job today, and uh, so that's pretty exciting. That's the main focus. Hey, James, how are you feeling? You yeah, good. Good? All right, let's go grab a coffee. Yep, thanks. Um, I haven't been good at meeting the world on the world's terms. I've sort of hidden away from it. So to, so to do this and get my medication done and you know, have breakfast and those sorts of things, just doing what normal people do, and I um, guess I'm getting a bit more normal. This will be my first proper job in 10 years. When I think, where's that 10 years gone? It's gone into me being really sick, but I'm really excited about taking, taking the plunge. James, how's it oh, going? Good, thanks. Come in. So I'll just read through a little bit of the job description. So I guess it's kind of like to fill in the gaps of the organisation and kind of the strengths that you bring to the organisation and how we kind of complement each other. Yeah. Um, so it's the community and media engagement manager. Um, so focusing on our relationships with our stakeholders, particularly like the community that we serve um, and 
because of your experience with media and producing and production and media stuff and radio shows, thought it'd be cool to like grow that. Yeah. Um, so that also kind of, there's a bit of comms aspect to that as well. Um, which, so you'll probably work closely with me in terms of like communication. That's it. Oh, what's that? This one? is the relapse prevention plan that I came up with with my psychologist. Really? For you guys to have a copy of. Oh, wow. Is this what you guys work on? Yeah. Part of our core business is to run forums for the community and for people um, using health services. And we just kind of come up with different topics that um, are big issues in the community that affect people, especially vulnerable people. Um, and we kind of, yeah, raise these issues and discuss them and talk about solutions that we can, we can come up with as a community to support each other. We're all about people who have lived experience. So having someone like James who's like kind of has a really intense past and brings like all that knowledge. It's basically about strategies to keep me well, like taking medication consistently, attend my appointments in therapy, regularly yeah. take the insulin and, and things like that. The stigma that mental health labels have on people um, and the way the general community look at, looks at a person with mental illness sometimes is frightening, sometimes is dangerous, sometimes is unintelligible. Uh, those are sort of some of the um, ideas that come through the media and we really want to counter that to, to prove that people with lived experience are full people are, and are dynamic in their own right rather than being doped up, drugged up, mad people. We need that like really, really badly. So I think, yeah, James is like well suited to the role. Okay, thanks, bye. So that was um, breakfast show um, tomorrow morning, asking if we wanted to go on to talk okay. about the uh, balance between like people's individual freedoms and rights, because we can't lock people up forever mm. or keep them yeah, Secret secreted forever. But then also, like, how do we keep people safe? Mm. And it would be at like 7 a.m. in the morning. I know. Are you doing going in? I, I was gonna, I'll come with you, and then do you wanna like be the spokesperson for it? Yeah. And I'll just be the support person. Do you wanna maybe meet here really early and I take us in? Yeah. Or, would that work? Yeah, that works. Okay. James is well suited to the role. Always nervous, anxious. I'm a seething pile of massive worms inside. With mental health particularly, it's always balancing patient liberties with safety of the person and family and the public. So it's a constant challenge. We've got a saying in mental health at the moment, instead of asking people who use services what's wrong with you, we have to start asking what happened to you to understand like what brought you to this point in your life where you're in crisis. Instead of being like, oh, this is just, you know, something, you're just like this, sorry about it, let's try and fix you. It's like, well, actually, you're, yeah, a person. Although, you know, the public demands the standardised uniform care of excellence across the country, you've got to be aware that not one size doesn't always fit all when it comes to mental health care. When it does go wrong, it goes spectacularly wrong. That's what the media likes to pick up on and that's what I end up commenting on a lot. Hi, I'm here for the breakfast show. Okay, uh, what's your name? Uh, Kieran. Okay, I'll let you know, no worries, mate. Thank you. I organised with James to meet him at um, 6 a.m. at the office so we could get ready um, together and go together, but <laughs> he didn't turn up. Could be medication side effects, that's really common. I just got her message from James. Sorry, alarm didn't go off. <laughs> like, so that wasn't as dramatic as I thought it would be. He just slept in. <laughs> oh well. 
from Changing Minds, a non-profit organisation focusing on mental health. We're joined this morning by Kieran Moorhead. Good morning to you, Kieran. Good morning. In the statistics I've been looking at, there is a spike in the number of people seeking or requiring mental health services. Yeah, so um, demand for mental health services has gone up 21% over five years. Um, and the funding of mental health services hasn't kept up with that demand at all. Just, yeah, there's always going to be not enough, really, but it's a matter of how we can kind of use the funding that we have better, and I think that's kind of the focus of the government at the moment. I missed the breakfast show today. I had my injection yesterday. That always wins me out. Um, and I didn't sleep very well, so I slept through my alarm, basically, is what happened. Still no excuse. I'm really sorry. If I had have made it, we would have been talking about patient rights and how being in hospital impinges on those rights, the rights to move around and stuff, and, and the freedom of association and things like that. People think that um, when you're in a psychiatric ward, you're locked up for being mad, whereas there are a whole bunch of reasons why someone is in a mental health unit, and um, there are a whole bunch of reasons why people's freedoms to come and go as they please, you know, should be protected. And this is my partner, Louise. Hello. Bringing us nice cups of tea. <laughs> Cheers. This is our best bone china. Thank you. We met at Toyora, and Louise immediately fell in love with me. I took my time, so I didn't want to be an easy catch. We've got our art in common. I think we have this, the same sense of social justice. He has a sense of flair in the way he presents himself to the world. He's not bad on the eye. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like he is very capable of doing this job that he's been offered and, uh, and very proud of him that he's been offered this position. It shows, you know, obviously how much other people think of James and the confidence they have in him and that I have in him. And I think he's really, really capable and I think he will succeed. Thank you. Pretty nice. Yeah, I get a lot of support from Louise, which is one of the reasons I think I've stayed out of hospital for the last two years, is because of the support she's provided me. You know, she's a real tower of strength. I really appreci appreciate that about you. This is King's Seat, the old cute hospital for um, people who suffered mental illness. I just live uh, a couple of steps over to the back of the, uh, the property where I've been for about 18 months now. It is an unnerving sort of spot. When you drive in at night, it's, you, know, you drive up the, the long driveway and you see the big main building at the end of it, it's quite intimidating. And I can imagine people who were coming here back in the day would have been terrified of what the place holds. To be locked away is the, the key thing, to lose your freedom so you can't go anywhere. And I guess this is why the place was so isolated, to keep you here. And when they talk about people leaving, they talk about them escaping, whereas this was a place supposedly for healing and you've got to wonder how much healing went on with the sort of draconian mechanisms that were used to keep people here. You've got to wonder. My first hospital experience was in Wellington at the Wellington unit. Um, I was studying um, journalism at the time and uh, I had a massive breakdown 
where I tried to commit suicide by taking an overdose. My relationship had broken up and things weren't going well at work. I was put in hospital as a result of that. And it was the first time I'd come into contact with people who were very unwell. So that was quite scary. Thing being homeless was the worst for mental health and, and health. I guess I chose to be homeless for for reasons that aren't that clear, really. It was just that I slept out on the street a couple of times, and then it became a habit, and it was something that I did full time. A lot of people who are homeless do have mental health needs and are in and out of the system. Enough of my trousers can do it now. But... So this is where I lived for a while back in 1999-2000. I lived here for about three or four months. It's right next door to Mount Eden Prison um, and the train. So we'd sleep up there, just on the edge. But yeah, I tucked myself up right at the back of the, the um, bridge there. I kept my head down. I didn't want to know anybody, so I didn't <laughs> converse with anybody, didn't talk to anybody. You never sleep well, actually, when you're homeless because it's too cold or too hot or too exposed and you're frightened people are going to come up and beat you up. I thought about how shit life was. That's what I thought about when I was up here. Oh, the voices would talk about passers-by and that everybody else's life is going really great and my life isn't what it should be. The first time things started to change for me was I went to the um, Pakaranga Library and I'd seen these pamphlets for AA and I um, picked one of them up and looked through the list of 13 things that make you an alcoholic and I think I was 12 of them and a bit iffy on the 13th. So I decided there was nothing else to do that evening I decided to go to an AA meeting, and that's where the start of coming back, I guess, happened. So we'll have the catering from okay. there. We'll set up a couple of tables. And just afternoon tea? Just afternoon okay. tea, yeah. yeah. Well, the first job that I have uh, in starting with Changing Minds is the role of organising the forums and panel discussions for the organisation. That's where we get members of the community to come to a talk where we discuss issues facing mental health and people with lived experience of mental health. I'm in a much better position than I was. I do have a place to call home. I do have supports around me, clinical supports and the supports of friends, and my work is a support to me now. Well, 30, 30 people have RSVP'd. Um, and there may be more, I don't know. I'm sorry, it hasn't printed out very well. Our printer's on the blink. Hi. Such a nice spot. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's lovely for to be supported yeah. by our board. Yeah, pretty good, thanks. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hey, you're a big I'll pass you on over to James. Thank, Thank you, you, and welcome to our first forum for the year. Um, Changing Minds is very proud to have presented to you. 
our experts in housing and housing related issues. I'd like to start with Edith Hawthorne. 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 Um, from CHAMP. Tell us a little bit about CHAMP. It's gratifying being here and doing it and I've got opportunities and chances to do things that I would have missed out on otherwise, so you know, I'm grateful for that. It feels somewhat bittersweet standing here today and welcoming James into his new role as Community and Media Manager at Changing Minds. I would like to acknowledge and thank James's partner Louise for her support of James. After reviewing our strategic direction, it became increasingly clear that we had an amazing but underutilised resource, James. <laughs> it goes without saying that um, there's no one better to be part of the operational team here at Changing Minds to help lead those brave conversations about mental health and addictions in Aotearoa. It's monumental really, it's been 10 years since I had full time work with my partner supporting me. I haven't been in hospital for two years now so it's a big deal to, to move into this. To all the people who've come to support Tammy and myself I thank you very much and hopefully I'll be able to do justice to the job. Thank you very much for being a part of the Changing Minds vibe. It's, um, it's really important and special. Thank you. I know that he's more than capable of doing this job. It's everything else that he faces that stands in the way, potentially, but... I think if he can gain, regain some self-confidence -conf and self-esteem in the position, then it will sort of hopefully spill, up, spill over into other parts of his life. If I could take away everything difficult for him, I would. Sometimes you go forward two steps and then you go backwards two steps, but that's OK as well. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect. It can just be whatever it is. When you've been unwell for so long, it, that becomes the norm. And so to break out of that, you do need a bit of bravery and a bit of, well, a zest for life, a desire for life. And that's what I've got now. 